dude can't deal with a real woman, so he objectifies an idealized form. He, he makes a sculpture. And as beautiful as she is, and she is beautiful, and as masterful as she is, and, she is ma and he is masterful, this woman's statue, this modest woman that he carves, is his image of a perfect woman. I don't know that the women would have carved the same image. When we talk about the objectification of women, the, to turn women into an object, which we see all over contemporary culture. You know, what's wrong with a beautiful woman? Nothing. But this beautiful woman has no voice, has no name, has no opinion, has no agency, has no power. She's just a projection of Pygmalion sculptors fantasy of the perfect idealized image. That's what it means to be objectified. To be objectified for someone to turn you into an object of their fantasy. And it's disempowering and it feels crummy and we should avoid it. People are more complex. They're not just our ideal, our projection, our fantasy. We have to listen and learn about real complex multidimensional people. So it's a legitimate critique of Ovid and of the representation of beautiful women throughout Western art that women have, some, have been somewhat objectified. They've been silenced. They've gone unnamed. They have been um, uh, uh, objects of male desire, of male idealization. And they only recently have we... Um, have they claimed the power and the specificity and the complexity of their own voice. So one way of interesting thing of how is this, how is, uh, how is Evelyn turning upside down, refiguring this Ovidian Pygmalion trip? Well, it's a woman sculptor and she's turning the real life Adam into an object. It's upside down. It's not turning an object into a real, a real woman. I mean, we see this in Pinocchio. You're a real boy. Uh, this Ovidian Pygmalion trope uh, happens in all kinds of, uh, all kinds of folk tales, all kinds of literature. That by somehow uh, great virtue and hard work, that the the puppet becomes a real boy. Uh, the statue becomes a beautiful real woman. Or now, in the shape of things, the real college student Adam become turns into an object and we get a sense of how crappy that would feel to be a plaything rather than a person. So that's a really complex use of an illusion or a master text that's bubbling under Labute's work. But then we could also look at the names of the main characters, Adam and e Evelyn, Adam and Eve, Genesis 2, the story of Eden. And what did what did Eve do? She ate the forbidden fruit. We call it an apple, but it's not. In the Bible, it's, it's a fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There are two trees, eternal life and the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge of the law, of the boundary, of the rules. Evelyn chose that fruit, and when she ate it, they suddenly had knowledge of right and wrong. It's the story in the Western Judeo-Christian tradition of understanding about rules and boundaries and breaking the law. So, hmm, we have a playing out again of boundaries, of breaking, of awareness. That moment when Evelyn reveals her project is exactly like the moment of that apple. All of a sudden, Adam has knowledge of what's been going on, knowledge of wrongdoing. And so it's really interesting to think about that story and think about Adam and Evelyn here and all the ways that Neil LeBute is playing against with turning upside down, rewriting, reinscribing this new morality tale given this long tradition of the fall from the Garden of Eden that we see in the Jewish and Christian schools sacred texts. Okay, so that's two, Pygmalion and Genesis. 
Um, but there's all these other ones you might look at and think about as well. There's references to Euripides and Medea. There's references to uh, My Fair Lady. Henry Higgins is the professor in My Fair Lady, a Broadway show of George Bernard Shaw's play called Pygmalion. Um, Kung Fu Grasapa. Kung Fu, what's, it's another TV show about a master and a student, about being formed, a student being formed by a master. So it's fun to look through all, they, and they pop out, you know, videos, they fly out, you don't even notice these things. It just seems like chit chat between Evelyn and Adam as they're getting to know each other. But these literary allusions are little signposts for those in the know that that little hints that uh, that um, that Neil Labute is using to uh, echo his themes, to point us in the way of what's going to happen, to tip us off. And I think one of the pleasures of watching something again, the pleasures of going back and reading the script, the pleasures of building up this this treasure of references that we have been doing together in this class is to suddenly see. Uh, it's nice to know the, the hints. It's nice to be kind of insiders with what's going on so we can better understand and uh, both and appreciate this, how carefully this piece is designed. So I'll go wrap up with, you know, what does this have to do with class? Well, you guys, you guys know the so what. You know, there's boundaries, there's limits, and there's contracts, and we need to be aware of what they are, and we need to know, uh, we need to be aware of deception, we, this boundary of, you know, we talk about the dimensions, nature, intensity, discernment, certainly, is she the one for me, issues of morality, of right and wrong, but all the way down, identity, did Adam go against his identity or did he fulfill it by becoming handsome on the inside and kind of corrupt on the inside? Um, uh, but that, that last one, representation. You know, love literature deals with issues of representation, issues of confusion, of make-believe and real life. The, the, what's it mean to represent virtue or to misrepresent virtue, to misrepresent love? So that last really tangle of kind of high concept, kind of difficult to articulate and to tease out issues of, I'm calling issues of representation. We really see that a lot in, uh, in the tale of Adam and Evelyn in the shape of things. So I like those are the dimensions. Um, I also, there's a very much another simpler so what. I love the shape of things because it is so constructed. It's kind of cool to me to notice, to excavate all the illusions, to, to just, I marvel at how clever Neil Labute is and how closely this very contemporary play follows the very, very old Greek tragic organization, Greek tragic form. There is a prologue, there's foreshadowing. There are plot developments. There is a cathartic climax. And it's just as effective now as it was on the, uh, you know, in the uh, Agora back in the day at the arena as they were playing out uh, in, um, uh, in, in classical Greece. It's just as effective today, that, that horror, that catharsis, that explosion of feeling that we have something in common with our Greek ancestors. As far away as 2020 is from Periclean Athens, our human nature seems to be very connected to those long ago times. And the structures that worked back then in ancient Greece are working still in uh, in 2020 uh, for us. So, hmm, I think that's cool. I think that's cool. I think it's cool how to notice how well constructed, how clever 
literary artists are like Labute, like Bro uh, like Annie Prue, like Marilyn Robinson. I marvel at the sophistication of their work and how it doesn't really show until we dig at it. And and as we do, there's there's intellectual satisfaction in uh, both in coming to terms to describe complex feelings and to uh, to just marveling at how beautifully, how cleverly, how carefully things can be put together uh, so that we can experience them, even though we didn't live through them. And I hope that none of us have to live through the kind of horror that uh, Adam and Evelyn lived through. On that note, hmm, on we go to Halloween. Good job, gang, and hang in there. We only have two more texts the namesake and Gilead to wrap up our semester. So uh, enjoy this uh, week with uh, The Shape of Things and um, we're heading into the home stretch.